Hey, George. Welcome to the His and Her Money Show. Hello, George. Hey, how you guys doing? We are doing well. Excited to have you on. I mean, we connected a long time ago, I, almost probably two years ago, and we finally were able to merge calendars and make this interview happen because, I mean, you're spreading some knowledge that needs to be spread. It's a, it's a wonderful wealth building strategy, and we had to get our audience this information. So we're thrilled to have you on today. But maybe there's people listening or watching that are being introduced to you for the first time. So could you say hello to everyone that is tuned in right now and let them know what you are all about? Awesome. First of all, I want to tell you guys, thank you for having me on your show. You guys don't know how much of a blessing your ministry has been to me. Uh, to see a couple in the kingdom that's doing ministry on the level that you guys are doing it at and setting people free financially, I am just honored for you guys to invite me on your show. I am thrilled to be a part of your ministry. And I just want to send you guys kudos from the kingdom perspective, man. You just don't see wow. many people who are married, who have unified together as one to be an example to the body of Christ of what it's supposed to look like inside of a marriage. And so wow, thank you. We appreciate that. I love you guys so much for the ministry that God has placed upon your life. I wish you nothing but exponential growth and, and much prosperity and success as you have helped set other people free and also help them grow in their prosperity and success as well. Amen. Wow, thank, thank you, you. sir. So um, guys, my name is George Howard. I've been teaching financial education wow, since I was 19 years old. I'm now uh, 43. Um, I know I look like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I got started in this thing. At, I was blessed at the age of 19 to get a, um, a job as a loan officer at the age of 19. And I had one of my best friends walk into my, he actually drove up from Gary, uh, with a $3,500 check. Now, you know, at 19, I was making $8 an hour and I thought that was good money back then, uh, at the bank. And, um, I was a credit, I was a credit analyst at the bank and he walked in with his check for $3,500 and I'm like, man, where'd you get that? He said, I'm a loan officer. What's that? I do mortgages. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Literally. And long story short, we went into his office and uh, the owner was there. It was a African-American company and the owner was there and he walked in and said, hey, why are you guys here on a Sunday? And, you know, we got to talk and he asked where I was at in school and I was at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. And uh, he said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, right now I'm a credit analyst at a bank. He's like, you're a credit analyst? I said, yes, sir. So he picks up a file and he literally throws it across the room and said, catch this. I caught it and I opened it up. He says, read the credit report. So I, I read the credit report and he said, you want a job? I just seen this check for $3,500. Yes, I want a job. <laughs> and so uh, I did not know at that time that God was literally putting me into a training program. I thought it was a way for me to make money at a young age. Um, Coming to find out, uh, I went to Nashville, Tennessee. I was a regional director uh, with Nashville, Tennessee, uh, with Bank of America. And uh, they put me into their training program. And I found out something that I'd never heard before, which was something called predatory lending. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was an African-American company. He owned seven branches uh, in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, and we were predatory lenders. Mm. And I found out in a training class in Dallas, Texas, literally saying that I've been hurting the community, not helping them. Mm. I, didn't, I didn't know. And so I made it my mission to try to undo. I couldn't undo what I'd done, but I wanted to make sure that it never happened to anyone else. And so we published a book called Edit Your Credit in 2002. Um, I was on a guest radio show uh, twice uh, to teach you know, my book. It was live calls coming in. And so the guy who hosted the show had to go out of town. He says, you know, the show was really, really productive. The calls were really good. Can you do one for me while I'm out of town? I said, sure. And I did a show by myself. And the owner had heard, the owner of the show had heard all three broadcasts and me handled the live calls. And he said, would you like your own show? Now, mind you, I'm 24 years old. He said, would you like your own show? I'm like, yes, I would love my own show. And so from 24 to 30, I was on every single day, an hour a day on the air in Nashville, Tennessee, across five different states. Um, teaching financial literacy, teaching financial empowerment. We opened three mortgage companies, was very successful. And then uh, the recession hit and um, President Barack Obama was running for office and he made a, um, a campaign promise that he was going to get the banks lending again. 
It's going to pass the bank bail out. It's going to lend again. And we like, go, Barack, go, right? And um, because we're dried up, we're not making any money at all. And so from like July to January, we may have closed maybe six, seven loans. And I had three companies. So um, most of my friends worked for me. And I was very successful when my friends were. And I didn't want to lay them off because they helped me get to where I was. And uh, so we're just like, okay, we just hold on to the, you know, the banks come back and they start lending again and they pass the bank bell out. We celebrated and the banks never start lending again. Hmm. And consequently, uh, I lost everything. Everything. And so I moved back to Gary, Indiana. And uh, long story short, uh, my father and I, uh, he's a pastor. Uh, we disagreed in some things and aspects of how he ministered and things that he did. And uh, I left and I ended up on my auntie's couch. And um, just, can I be transparent? Absolutely. Please do. Yes. Okay. Um, you know, guys, I've been preaching the ministry all my, since age of 17. And um, I was living in sin. I ended up moving in with my girlfriend at the time because I no longer wanted to be on the couch. Um, but that was one of the worst relationships I've been in in a very long time. And uh, I had nowhere to go. Like, I'm like, God. I don't want to go back to my auntie's couch. What am I going to do? And so uh, I heard about the tax sale. I read about the tax sale. I actually went to a conference while I was at Purdue. Uh, and then the internet wasn't as, as big as it was then. It's about 94, 95. And um, I ended up going to a tax sale. I ended up buying uh, a lien for $300. And that lien turned into a house. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. So on the weekends, I, I would go fix up my house and work on it and whatever, and I ended up selling it for $54,000. It was going to be my personal house, and I ended up selling it for $54,000. I bought it for three hundred. dollars I, I probably had about $5,000 into the property total. Um, and that $5,000 was you know, me working, fixing it up, and doing things like that. And, um, and the truth is, the reason that I did the work is because I didn't have the money for somebody else to do it, right? So me and you two became really good friends. Uh, we sold the property and I went back to the auction. I bought some more. And I went back to the auction and bought some more. And I went back to the auction and bought some more. And so today we own over 100 properties, absolutely debt free. Um, wow. And wow. Um, God has just restored everything that I lost then and, and times, t times 10. I feel like Joe, right? Lost everything and then God says, I'm going to give you double. And uh, he's been so faithful when he's done those things. And it's funny because I questioned him when I was going through those trying times. I questioned him. I was questioning God. Like, I don't understand why I'm doing this. I'm standing up for righteousness. I'm trying to do right. I'm living right. And I did not know that God was not only teaching me uh, the process of not only setting people free and what it was like um, to be humble again. And I'm just being honest with you. You know, by the time I was 30, when I owned my mortgage companies on there, I was a, I, by the time I was 30, I was a millionaire. And I lost everything. Um, but one of the things that God reminded me of is that when I started doing well in life, it turned from people to profits for, for the corporation. I ended up bringing somebody else in because we're doing conferences and workshops. We had the radio show. We did books. And so I brought somebody else in to run the mortgage companies who did not have the same passion for people. And it became about profits and numbers instead of the people. And God had to remind me that when he restores me, that I always put his people first and he'll take care of the prophets. Wow. That is absolutely wow. powerful, man. That is, that is awesome. So, I mean, now fast forward to nowadays, you spend a lot of time teaching people, uh, one about wealth. You have, I think it's six steps to, uh, financial freedom. You have these six steps, these, these core pillars of what, I guess what you've learned as a result of the ups and downs going from the mountaintop, being a millionaire by 30 and then losing it all. And now owning a hundred, over a hundred properties debt free. I mean, my gosh, that is one heck of a journey. And I know I just, he, and he just testified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I know, but I know that there are people listening and because we, we tend to be pessimistic. Um, how am I going to find a house for $300? Lucky him. He found a house or for $300. I'm not handy. I can't fix, I can't fix up a house, you know? Mm -hmm. So one, um, is this something anybody can do? Cause people might have never heard of tax sales or they could be like you 
have heard it, but like when you first heard it, you didn't really pay much attention to you like, ah, nah, nah. so I mean, you've been doing this for a while. Talk about the legitimacy of this strategy as a tool to build wealth. I think it's the, I call it the best investment ever. Um, and I'll just kind of give a history of tax sales, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, back in the 1700s, the late 1700s, uh, they had to find a way to make people pay property taxes because um, property taxes fund so many different things. And so uh, they came up with the whole uh, feudal system, which is, you know, existed way before then. The feudal system, which is where um, the county has the right to put a lien against the property if you don't pay your taxes. And then it doesn't help the county to put a penalty on it and then put a lien against it because they still don't have money. And so in order to help them meet their budget, they will sell that lien to an investor. And then when the property owner pays their penalty to of their taxes, you will get that penalty back as an investment on your property. And so in every single state, that penalty is different. In my state in, in Indiana, it is 10%. But in Florida, it's 18%. In Texas, it's 25%. In Iowa, it's 24%. In Michigan, it's 24%. And these are like guaranteed investments because it's secured by the real estate. The awesome thing is, is that if they don't pay their property taxes and you have a lien against it, you supersede all other liens because it's a county lien. Um, which means if there's a mortgage on the property, you supersede the mortgage. If there is a, a lien against it because they had a business loan or they had a contractor's lien, you supersede that lien. Which means that now I'm in first lien position. So when they no longer, when they don't pay their property taxes, even if there's a mortgage against the house, I get the property debt free. Wow. Right. So we literally have bought property that had eighty and ninety thousand dollar mortgages on them, and we that that it was it was it was it was dissolved. It was we get a lien unencumbered, and wow. so that's the awesome thing about this process. Uh, it's been here. Tax lien sales are they're older than the Federal Reserve System, and they're older than Wall Street. The problem is that nobody teaches it because most of the people who were involved in this were your hedge fund investors, and so. Your hedge funds were taking money from us, from mutual funds or for 401ks, giving us four or five or 6% and telling us that's good returns. And then we're getting guaranteed returns of 24 and 18 and 36% and 25% guaranteed investments and giving us four or five or 6%. And in many cases, they got actually real estate. And that's how they built the big buildings. That's how they have the nice offices. And that's how they drive the cars they drive and how the jets they do is because they make larger investments and give us a piece of it, uh, but the majority of it goes to them. And the investments that they're making are the, the tax liens? Yes, ma'am. We, we compete against hedge fund investors. Wow. This it's so. amazing because you're right. Nobody knows this. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows this information. So this information is out here. And, what and, we, and that's why you have to be subscribed to the His and Her Money Show, people. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And, and what's so intriguing about this is that you did it right? Like, I mean, you're just an average person. There's nothing, I mean, I'm not going to say there's nothing special about you, but it's not. so many words, I can do it too. They yes. can do it and too. And you were at your right? lowest point. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, you sir. had lost it all. You desperation. Weren't... I was desperate. Like, I got to do something. Right. So, yeah. so what do you say to people? Because I'm going to admit, I know for a fact that prior to me getting into the His or Her Money show and, and interviewing people and just finding out more information, back in the day, I would have probably thought it was something to this. Mm -hmm. Like, Seems there's, good no, to be true. Yeah, there's no way that you can go and buy a property for pennies on the dollar like that or a lien and possibly own the property in the event. Outright. Like, yeah, outright. So I would have thought that it was something to it. So talk about that because I'm sure you get a lot I of naysayers all, or people thinking... Uh, are they going to come back and look for me? Like, what's, what's all that about? So um, I get it all the time, number one. And uh, one of the things about real estate that I, I absolutely love is that, you know, there's receipts for it. You cannot own real estate without it being recorded. At, recorded. So Lake County, my name is George Howard. You go to the recorder's office, put in my name. And you will <laughs> see, literally, it will say tax D, George Howard. And then it will say $500, $500, $1,000, $800, $1,000. And you will see over 100 properties literally there, uh, all with my name on them for what I bought them for. And I'm telling you, some of the properties that we bought, uh, since we've been transparent, 
Um, people say, well, George, what do you do for a living? And I say, well, I'm breaking houses for a living. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a character, you guys, you don't know. Uh, you're not, and I'm going to give a full disclaimer here, you're not supposed to actually go on the property before you buy the sale, before you buy it. Uh, but it, if there's, and we, in our courses, we teach you how to tell if a property is vacant. And uh, if I see three or four uh, of the elements that we look for are all confirmed, that that property is vacant, I'm going to look through a window. And if I see that that property doesn't have any furniture in it or is abandoned, I want to try a door, right? <laughs> and so what we do is we do a quick assessment. I literally walk in for like two minutes. I do a quick assessment and say, okay, um, this is not what I want to do. You know, it's, it's, it's way too far gone. I don't want to put this much money in. I don't want to do this. Um, and that's kind of how we kind of got started and was able to get very, very good property. Now I'll take, you know, some more damaged properties because I know what I'm doing. Uh, but then um, I, I only did the pick and choosing. Um, the unfortunate thing about this process right now is that uh, I talk too much. So I've been on all across social media, broadcasting, talking about it. And then a lot of other people who are educators uh, have come on and taken our course and they've educated. And so now we go to the auction, you see a lot of more people in the kingdom who are buying property debt free. And it's a blessing. It was for, with the last auction, we went to, we went out to eat and we were literally at a table with like 17 people. I had no wow. clue. Uh, Cause one of my mentees is also an educator. And so she had a whole group there and you know, we were sitting there. And so I said, well, how'd you get involved with the tax sale? And you know, everybody went around, how many properties did you get? And uh, we had 70 properties at the table um, that it was actually more than 70 that that table had bought at that particular sale. And most of them were first time tax buyers. And everybody at the table, not one person other than my team knew me directly, but everybody heard about it from somebody who's been in a student at Financial Freedom University. Wow. And so that to say that table had 70 properties and that was just that table, God has, been, God has allowed this to be a platform for wealth transfer that I never imagined that this would bloom. Mm -hmm. I never, guys, I stopped teaching because I felt unqualified. I stopped teaching and a guy by the name of Ronnie Bickerstaff hit me up in my inbox and he says, George, the kingdom needs the information that you have and you're not teaching it. And God was already dealing with me, like literally waking me up at three or four o'clock in the morning, literally dealing with me. And so I'm going to start teaching again. And so I got on Periscope, had no clue what Periscope was. Uh, got on it, kind of watched people do what they do. I had to start broadcast, but then I started teaching. And many a times for like a month, uh, it was just me and my assistant, Brittany. And I taught like I had a hundred people in the room and um, God was faithful with it. He, he was. And I remember my first person on Andrea Greer was my very first person that came. And I was like, ah, somebody's in the room. Like, <laughs> 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 right. And um, I started teaching just financial literacy, financial, um, fi financial empowerment. And um, the sale the tax sale was coming around. I said, well, guys, I got a tax sale coming around. By this time, it's 10 people in the room. So I'm really big, right? By, by now, it's 10 people in the room. And I said, I'm going to this auction, so I'm going to tell you guys what I'm doing. And um, about the third day of me teaching it, uh, they said, can we send you money? And I was like, you don't know me. You, you would send me money and you don't know me? And it's like, yeah, I want to send you money. So I was like, well, let me draw up some agreements just so you guys have something in writing to assure you that I'm not going to run away with your money. And everybody there got a property. Mm -hmm. Every single person wow. that sent money walked away with a lien. I take that back. One got redeemed. And I'll tell you what redemption means in a minute. Uh, one got redeemed and they, um, excuse me. So one got redeemed and they still ended up with a property because they bought it from another, they bought a property from another investor. Uh, to this day, um, their property rents for $1,175 a month. They bought it for $500. Uh, another property, we ended up flipping it and she made about $40,000 in 30 days. Um, the other young lady is a single mother of three uh, out of Nashville. Uh, her property rents for $800 a month. We bought it for $500. And then I bought one for $500 and that property rents for $1,000 a month. Oh, wow. So. Uh, that was the very, very first time we actually had investors come in. And so we, you know, of course, started celebrating and telling people about it. And so other people was like, hey, can I send you money too? And I'm like, uh, let me call an attorney, right? <laughs> so when you're, when you're doing this, like, I mean, 
gosh, it sounds so like awesome to find properties for five hundred, a thousand dollars. What type of shape are these houses in? I mean, they. It, my mind tells me, you know, if I'm paying five hundred dollars for a whole house, how much am I gonna have to put into it to make it a nice house that I can rent out to other people? It's your due diligence. It's your research. And guys, you guys, it's two th two things that you're doing when you get in two different phases. Um, one is the research phase and the other one is the legal phase. The legal phase, I really recommend for you to hire an attorney. We used to teach how to do this legally, like how to go through the legal process. We no longer teach it here because uh, the legal process can be so extended. Well, we've had, God was just gracious to us because we had some of the issues that we ended up having later on, but we had to hire attorneys. I wouldn't have got into this, right? So sometimes God will hide things from you just so um, you get your feet wet and then he'll let you see the, whole, the real thing. Like, God, I didn't see this. And so um, the legal process, this is how an attorney you guys for is it's, it's worth the investment into the property. But the research part, I mean, it's, it's up to you. It's, it's so, for example, uh, I'm in Lake County, Indiana. Uh, Lake County, Indiana, uh, their tax sale will have about 14,000 properties on them. Out of those 14,000 properties, through your due diligence, is your responsibility to go through and search those 14,000 properties to find one that's the gold nugget. And so um, I tell people that my mom, when I was growing up, my mom was a shopaholic. Literally. I hate it. I, st I, I think she messed me up because to this day, I don't like shopping. So that's probably why I ain't married because I ain't going to no more. Like I'm just not, <laughs> I'm cursed. Like I'm just not going to go. My mom will go to a store and she literally, she's the clearance woman. She's going to go to the clearance rack and she's literally going to start. My mom's about a size 12 forward. About that time she's 12, about a 16 now. She'd probably kill me if she knew I told her size. <laughs> All right. And she would go to a, the section that says two or small and she would just go like this. And I'm like, mom, why are we over here? All right. And she would say, you never know, baby. People put stuff back in the wrong places. And so she had the diligence to literally go like this on the racks until she found what she was looking for. And I take that analogy now and I use that to say that 14,000 properties, literally as you're driving by every residence, you're literally taking the rack and you're going through to find that, that sale, that, that item that you're looking for. And uh, it is, we, we will spend, uh, my team and I, uh, God has blessed me with a team now, but my team and I will spend about a thousand hours in auction um just going out making sure that our properties are legit doing the research going back and finding um because there's a process to find out who's going to redeem and who's not going to redeem because i don't want to spend a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars on a property and then they give me ten percent like ten percent is a wonderful investment it, it is but i'm not in this for ten percent i'm in this for the property and so uh, there's some other research things that we look for now um that, you know, and I'll, I'll tell you guys, guys, if you guys find a way to find non-performing assets for a bank, um, that is what you want to do. And I'll say it again, non-performing assets. And that is where the bank has a mortgage on the property, but they're not making money on it. They're losing money on it. And so the bank has to make a decision. Uh, do we want to pay the taxes on this property uh, before we lose it? Or do we, would we rather just get it off our books? Because if they pay the taxes, they're going to have to actually do property preservation on it. They're going to have to list the property with the realtor. They're going to have to pay up the back taxes. And so they're further investing into a property that's no longer performing for them. And so because you found that, and I teach you how to do that, then uh, that's part of our research process. Then you say, okay, I think this is the good one. I think this is the good one. Uh, and you also look at the condition of the property. Just being honest, you know, I've put $20,000 into a property. But I also got property that I've never put a quarter into. We buy property literally with tenants already in them. And if they're already living in those conditions, whatever they tell me they were paying, I'm fine with it. I was paying $500. Okay, I paid the house for $500. Give me $500 a month, I made $6,000 and you're $500. Okay, I'm fine with that. And the reason I do that, I know that property will rent for seven. But my thing is, if they move out, I got to go in the house and fix every single thing that's wrong with it. I mean, electricity, flooring, walls, cabinets, uh, bathrooms, you, you name it, I have to fix it. So I would rather just get money on my money and let them pay for my renovations whenever they decide to move out. Mm. And so that's the strategy that we go into that. And that's one of the things that we teach. Look for properties occupied. Look for properties occupied. And we buy several properties, several of them, 
that are already occupied. Is it difficult to figure out um, which ones are occupied with tenants versus homeowners? Okay, I'm gonna get out to this free. I'm gonna get this is free. This is something we teach at our conference and also in our courses. Uh, one of the things you wanna look for when you are doing your research is that you wanna find the name of the homeowner, right? It's gonna be on every document that you pull up. It's gonna actually be, it's gonna be on that sheet, like who owns it. Uh, when you go up to pull up the property record during your research, it's gonna have a mailing address. If that mailing address is different from that property address, unless it's the PO box, and even then if it's a PO box, it's probably an investor, because homeowners don't have PO boxes they send their taxes to. Um, if that is different, then it's probably an investment property. That's the first way you want to look. The second way you want to look is see if there's a homestead exemption on the property. Uh, because property owners that live in the property get a homestead exemption, and that homestead exemption means that it's owner-occupied. Well, typically, it doesn't always mean that. But if I get two confirmations that there's no homestead exemption and the addresses don't match, I'm 99% sure that that's the tenant in property. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned, um, I know everybody's like, yo, I'm in, right? <laughs> but, uh, you, mentioned, you referenced, you referenced um, Lake County, Indiana. So say I'm in Atlanta or Dallas or Baltimore. Do I have opportunities like this or is it only in certain spots? Great question. Thank you for the question too. Yes, every single county in the country has at least one cell a year. Now watch this, you guys. And this is the thing that kind of upsets you uh, as educators is that you have an investment that is secured by real estate. They have it in every single county. It's over 3,300 counties in the country. It's in every county in the country. There's state legislation that has been written on how this sale will be organized. It's done at the county courthouse and they publish it in the newspaper and nobody's heard about it. Mm. So wait, is the oldest investment in America is before Wall Street, before the Federal Reserve System, is in the newspaper, is state legislature, and is done at the courthouse, and nobody knows about it? That's correct. Uh, and it's done in every single county. Now, and full disclosure, I'm really, really blessed uh, to live in the county that I'm in um, because there's two different sales, and I don't know how deep you guys want me to go with this, because every county has two or three different sales, all right? Uh, they have a very first sale, what they call it, the A sale. Um, the A sale is where they, they, the county want all of their money, right? So it, it could be $10,000 in back taxes. But if I'm buying a $150,000 property and I, you know, I'm paying $10,000 for it, it's worth it to me. But then there's a B sale. A B sale is the properties that did not sell at the A sale go to the B sale. You know, if you didn't make the varsity team, you went to the junior varsity team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So they may not be as good, but they're still good. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Michael Jordan guys got cut. He didn't make the JV team. So just think about it. You can be good, just right. didn't make it. Or it could be a hidden nugget. Nobody's seen it. Uh, literally, I ran home to get here. I just met a guy today. Um, they're bringing a casino to Gary, Indiana. He bought two acres for $500 and he bought them smack dead in the middle of where they're building the casino. They're in negotiation for two hundred thousand dollars right now. Wow! And he bought it from a tax lien sale. Five hundred dollars, two acres of land. Wow! Mac, they cannot build unless he sells. Wow! But I talked to him. I somebody else told you know the streets talk. The tax lien streets talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to the courthouse today, and um, another friend of mine was like, "Hey, you see that guy over there?" You know, I said, yeah, he's a big buyer. He said, man, he just bought land where the casinos are going, man. The casino people are here right now. I said, really? He said, yeah, they want to see who's going to get the property. I was like, what? So I went over, of course, me. I'm going to go talk to him. And uh, I said, man, you must be the research king. I thought we were the research king. You're the research king. And he said, I said, how did you know they were going to build it? He says, well, they had released like five different spots that they were going to think about maybe spots for the casino. He says, George, but you got to think about it. All the spots flooded, but one. Mm. Because Gary only have so many exits. This was right off the exit, and it didn't flood. So I just took a shot in the dark and bought a property for five hundred dollars. Well, he bought lot. He bought land. Took a shot in the dark, and bingo, he hit the spot. They have to now buy him out. A five hundred dollar investment. He's looking at two hundred 
thousand dollars. This was just today. Today. Wow. I'm sick, right? I'm sick because I had the same opportunity and I didn't see it. Like I'm now, so let me ask you this though. Did the casino have a, a chance or option to purchase it themselves for the private? They could have. They they could have and they didn't. Wow. Yep, they could have. Anybody, the wow. guys, you do not need a license for this. You do not need a real estate license, an investment license. You just get to go to the tax lane sale as a regular public citizen. It's in, so for example, Atlanta. Guys, Atlanta, they have them once a month. Every, I think it's every first or second Tuesday, they have them. Texas, they have them once a month. Like you guys have 12 auctions and most people don't even know it. Wow. Some of them once a week. Indiana has them twice a year. Um, there's another, sometimes if you don't, I remember I talked about the A sale and the B sale. Some people have what's called OTC sale, which is over the counter. So like you go in and get a prescription drug over the counter, you can get a list and go in to your state office, the county, and say, I want this property. They'll say it's this much, and you pay it, and you walk away with a property debt-free. Other counties have land banks, right? Like, guys, it's, it's so many ways to make money out here. Uh, the problem is that nobody's teaching it because it's not economical for them. Mm. Your banker doesn't make money off a tax sale. Your real estate broker doesn't make money off a tax sale. Your loan officer doesn't make money off a tax sale. Your investment broker doesn't make money off a tax sale. So who's going to take time to teach it to you when nobody's going to make money off of it? Imagine a life where your money isn't strangled by mortgage payments. Imagine what you could do when you don't have to send them money that you work so hard for. Come get simple, powerful, and real solutions to eliminating monthly mortgage payments forever. America's number one money couple presents Crush My Mortgage. In this exclusive course, you will be equipped with strategies to help you move faster toward the promised land of owning your house free and clear. Learn strategies to help you in the areas of payment acceleration, extra income generation, and wealth creation, all to help you crush your mortgage. Visit crushmymortgage.com and get started today. Join us on the path to power, freedom, and legacy. That's crushmymortgage.com. So what are some financial considerations that one should have in mind before heading to a tax sale? Because we don't want people just to show up and you know they're not prepared so there's we know you know there's the money that you need for the actual you know bidding for the property are there any other financial considerations that we should have in the back of our mind or that we should be projecting for as we're looking to make this a wealth business strategy for ourselves definitely and great question again uh number one uh always take into consideration that there are legal fees in this if you guys I'm urging you guys not to represent yourself. And I used to say, no, just represent yourself. No, don't do it. <laughs> just don't do it. I'm telling you, it's just worth it. You know, for us, it's a thousand dollars. But because we get so many, we negotiated with an attorney that's pretty good and we don't pay that much. Um, but if you have to pay an additional thousand dollars to get a property and you bought it for 500, you got a $1,500 investment, it's worth it. It really is. Um, so number one, consider the legal fees. Number so two, what does the attorney do though? When you say legal fees, what are they actually doing? Making sure that the property is transferred to you once the redemption period is over. Right. So what happens is that you're literally going through a foreclosure process. So once you get the D or once you get the your lien, because when you go to a tax lien sale, you're not buying a property, you're buying a lien against the property. That homeowner has so much time to pay their taxes up plus my penalty. And if they don't pay it by that time, that's their redemption period. If they don't redeem that property within that time, here it's 120 days, right? Some states is a year. Some states is two years. And then finally some states are three years. Alabama, uh, Louisiana, those are three-year states. I stay away from three-year states. Tech, Florida is a two-year state. But again, that's the A sale. B sale or OTCs are still there. Like, so they still have properties that roll around to over-the-counter sales or have a B sale where you can actually go, literally go in. And uh, that's a bit more of an advanced teaching. But uh, one of the fees would be, so what you're doing is you're going through a foreclosure process. And so they have to, Brittany, you have a file over there that I can, uh, that you can give me as an example. They literally have to go through and notify the people in our state. The first thing they notify them of is say, hey, somebody, hey, my name is George Howard. I bought your, your lien against your property. Uh, you have this much time to redeem your property. This is how much it costs to redeem your property. And this is the date you have to redeem it. 
right? So pay me my money. I tell people like this, pay me my money plus my interest so I can, you know, get out your hair. Um, then the second time, once it's expired, once the time has expired, we have to notify them again and let them know, hey, you didn't redeem your property. I'm going to court to ask for ownership if you have the right to object. So meet me in court on this day, right? 98% of the time, nobody shows up. 98%. When they do show up, that's when you probably want to get an attorney because they're probably going to have an attorney. And I don't understand this. You didn't have money to pay your taxes, but you had money for an attorney. I don't understand, but I've seen it done. Um, and the objection process really is like, did you really legally meet the state statute as the time considerations But when you gave them the mail, that you put it in the newspaper, that you actually put something on their door? If you can go in there and show that you did all of those things within the time statute, then you get your paperwork or you get your deed. Um, but again, I'm making it sound more simplistic. I really urge you to get an attorney for that. That's one thing that you want to look at when it comes to economics. Uh, the second thing with economics is that, um, the construction end of it, if the property is vacant, you have to get that property up to code and you don't know how long it's been vacant for, or you actually, you can, there's another tip I give you guys for free, pick up the phone, call a utility company and ask when was the last time utilities were on that home. That would give you an estimated an estimate of how long that property's been vacant. Um, so most people don't live in property without having utilities. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the second way that you guys can. Oh, it's been vacant for ten years. There's going to really be some problems. And the older or the longer it's been vacant, the more problems you're going to find in the home. It's just it's it's just the truth. Um, look at roof. The first thing I teach is always when you're driving by, the first thing you want to do is look at roofs. Uh, I went and bought a drone that's now tax deductible. I got a nice toy. Yeah, I heard that the other day. <laughs> I heard that, yeah. Wow. Yep. Tax so you're droning over top of these prospective homes. Yes, sir. Uh, so I drone to take my drone up. Uh, I fly it over to look at the roof to make sure um, that, you know, there's no holes in the roof because the, your roof is the life of your house. If there's a hole in the roof, there's a hole in the roof, then there's probably a hole in your ceiling. If there's a hole in your ceiling, then there's probably some electrical problems. If there's a hole in your ceiling, you have hardwood floors, that water's hit the hardwood, and that's run away your floor. And so now you have joist issues, you have subflooring issues, you have hardwood floor issues, you have plumbing, I mean, you have electrical issues, you have drywall issues, and you have a roof issue. So it wasn't just a roof issue, mm -hmm. right? And so these are some of the things, and I learned this as I went along, uh, along the way, which is you know why I tell people I'm breaking houses for a living. Um, I learned it along the way, uh, but construction costs is also something that you want to take into consideration. And I call it what we call, um, uh, I, I try to take all the emotion out of an auction. And it, the auctions are very emotional. Like you get caught up in a minute, like, oh God, I want this house, I want this house. And you just bid and bid and bid and like, oh my God, how much money I got? Okay, I'm going to keep going, right? No, don't do it. It's, it's emotional. Um, the auctioneer actually teaches our conference. Uh, Don is a awesome guy. He comes to teach our conference every single year. Uh, every conference we ever had, he's been there. Um, at least the one for Lake County. And, um, one of the things that he tells us is they, man, I'm paying on commission. Like my job is to get this sale to get as high as it can. That's my job. I got to make money for the county, the more money I make for the county, the more money I make. And the reason the auctioneers speak in the tone and the pace that they speak in it's because they're trying to put you in a cadence. And that cadence, and he literally teaches this, he said that cadence is almost like charming a snake to where you're like this. And the only thing you see is me and the property. And I want you to keep doing this because the more you do this, the more money I make. Mm. I try to take you out of that. And the way that I do that is I teach you return on investment. And so um, when I first got started, my numbers weren't this big, but now my numbers are here. I want to be in and out for $20,000 of the property. So I may be at ten thousand dollars on the property, knowing there's only ten thousand dollars worth of construction on it. So I'm in for twenty, but I know that house is going to rent for eight hundred dollars a month. Well, if it rents for eight hundred dollars a month, that's nine thousand six hundred dollars a year. I'm getting a fifty percent return on my investment every single year. Where else can I go and get a fifty percent return on my investment? And so if I go into the if I go into the auction, knowing what it'll rent for and knowing how much my construction costs are, now I can figure out how much I can bid and still get my rate of return. And so now I know that number. If I want a 25% or a 50% rate of return, then I can only be at $4,000 in this property, right? And so now I've been able to remove the emotions because now it's about numbers. Because the more you bid, the lower your, the lower your rate of return, the, the higher it is. And so 
um, that's one of the things we've been able to teach to try to bring you out of that, that, that whole uh, bidding too much and getting too emotionally involved. Guys, don't fall in love with these properties. They're not yours, right? Uh, they only become yours after the redemption period. Um, now, there are some states uh, where they're not lien sales. They're deed sales. Those states are going to be higher because you're not buying a lien. You're buying the property. Yeah. Michigan is a deed state. And Michigan has sold a lot of property that I missed out on for $500. Detroit was literally bought up by people who are of Asian descent. Mm -hmm. They bought over 200, no, 20,000, no, it was 200. I gotta make sure I gotta Google it. It's over 100,000 properties. I feel comfortable saying over 100. That too, yeah. yeah. They bought over 100,000 properties from the tax lien sale. And they came into the, the communities uh, that were mostly poor and bought up all of this property while people sat there and fought for it because they could not afford to pay their property taxes. And we lost a whole community to foreign investors. Wow. Because we just don't know. We didn't, they, we didn't know. And so those people could have literally bought their property or somebody else could have bought their property in the family for $500. Wow. So like yeah. knowledge, applying knowledge is power applying and getting knowledge. this information out there. So I have two questions. One question is, um, are you a fan over one particular like land or actual properties, you know, like the buildings or their houses? Or, and my second question is, are you a big fan of, owning outright because i mean you own all these houses or this this property now completely debt free and i know that you always also hear about people saying use yeah. other people's money people, or go know, to the bank say and you can get... do a cash out refi and use that yeah. money to buy more properties so talk about that too so i know those are two different questions but i wanted to get those out while i can still remember excellent that. questions and i say y'all that's just why this is the head and her money show y'all <laughs> they're they gonna make sure they get this content together <laughs> <laughs> We love our people. <laughs> so number one, the, the first question is uh, land over buildings. Before today, I would have had a different answer. <laughs> That's why I asked the question. Yeah. Before today, and actually when we were talking, he said, man, you got to think about it, George. Um, there's only so much land. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to come get it. That's what the I The taxes on it is, they're pennies. Yep. So for me, and I, I'm just going to answer your second question too, you guys. I'm all about assets. That's an asset is not something to depreciate in value. That's not an asset. An asset is something that pays you on a regular occasion. I want to say it again. I know that we've been taught an asset is something that was appreciated in value is an asset. Yeah, but it's not liquid. And if it's costing you money, it's a liability. Mm -hmm. If it's making you money, it's an asset. If it's costing you money, it's a liability. If it's making you money, it's an asset. If you buy land, and you got to pay taxes on that land every single year, it becomes a liability. It's not an asset until it sells. I want you to get, I want, and the reason I want to make sure that I explain that that way is because you may hold that land for five or 10 years and you have to pay those taxes on it and you didn't get a return. Now, when you sell it, is the return worth it? Yes, it's going to be worth it. But understand that there's a maintenance cost to keeping that. Mm -hmm. There's, it would be, you know, the Bible talks about, you know, the man that, you know, started to build and didn't count the cost. And when he, you know, failed to complete it, people talked about him. So you go to a tax sale, you buy land and you hold it for five years and then you lose it back to the tax sale. You didn't count the cost. So I would only say invest in land unless you know you have the capital to maintain it. Because there are things like weed liens. The county can put a weed lien against it. If they have to come out and cut, the, cut your yard, and they're going to charge you 10 times the rate. You're not going to pay $20. It's going to be 200 for a, hair, for, for a yard cutting, for a lawn cutting, right? So those are the things you want to consider when it comes to that. For me, um, before today, I would have said property, but after today, I'm really going to start looking at land. <laughs> I promise you. Um, he also told me, he said, man, I bought 10 acres across the street. I'm telling you, he said, I bought 10 acres across the street. And you know they're going to build yeah, across the street. because the casino's because, there, so yeah. and he commercial said, companies are coming. And he said, and nobody bid it against me. He said, you didn't, he, he said, talking to me, he said, you didn't bid it. Nobody bid it against me. I said, so you got it for $500? He said, all of them. He says, now that wasn't one parcel. He bought several parcels that equal 10 acres. So not only did he get land that's going to be the casino, but you know, the restaurants, the hotels and everybody else, gas station, everybody else is coming 
They have to go through him. Wow. And I missed it. That's why the Bible talks about that. You know, the Bible says um, that the rich and the poor have this in common. That God gives sight to both their eyes. Proverbs 29 and I believe it's 18. Proverbs 29, 18. So God gives sight to both their eyes. And what God is saying is that God, the poor and the common see the same thing, but not each one of them have the same vision. And so you're only able to grow wealth to your ability to how far you can see. Yeah. So where I seen vacant land, he seen opportunity. Right. We both seen the same That's thing. So true. Mm-hmm. Proverbs 29 and goes on further down, I believe it's around 21. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And so really what the scripture is saying is that if you don't have, you can only grow to the extent that your mind has been developed to be able to see. So I got a good lesson today that opened my eyes to say, you know what, maybe I should look at this land thing too. So to answer your question, I'm learning in that area. Uh, Before today, I would have said definitely buildings. I don't like land because lands are liabilities, but this one, (laughs) and that's, it's very rare. You guys, God did his research. He took time to try to figure out, you know, there's five different spots. I don't think that I'm going to eliminate them one by one. I think it's this one. He took a gamble on it. It came out to be successful. He went back to the auction, bought a land across the street after they had announced where it's going to be, bought land across the street and nobody is vacant land. Nobody bid it against him. So he did his research. He was intellectual enough to say, you know, where are they coming next? And can I buy property where they're going to be coming next? And that's where he went. And so that's, that's important. The second question you have is, am I all for debt-free property? That is a very hard question. And I want to answer it two different ways, if you don't mind me. I teach debt-free living. You teach debt-free living. I believe in debt-free living. Um, there is no such thing as good debt or good consumer debt. That it does not exist. Guys, you cannot finance Gucci, Louis, and cars, and Rolexes, and furniture, and uh, all the things that we finance and they're not assets, you're financing liabilities. It does not work, it will keep you poor, it will keep you broke, and you will never make it. However, when you leave consumerism, and you go over here to capitalism, and you use debt as a tool and not as a lifestyle, it now turns into a different product. And I have to be careful when I say this, because the way the world teaches this, the world teaches it from a perspective of over leveraging yourself. So for me, and this is what I teach, I only borrow to the ability that I can pay for. So this is how I put it, is that if I can't write a check for at least 75% of that debt, I'm not going to go get it. And this is why. Companies go bankrupt, not because they don't have good products. Companies go bankrupt because they don't have liquid assets. If they had liquid assets to hold on to make it through the troubled time that they had, they could actually begin to reevaluate their business model, adjust their pricing, look at their customer service and hold on. The problem is that they have assets, but they don't have any money. And so you don't have any liquid money and you can't hold on. So you have to file bankruptcy. That's why. Well, guys, you are your own business. You are your own economy. And just because like, for instance, I got over hundred properties, guys, I, on paper, I'm a mecha, a deck of millionaire, but I ain't got $10 million in the bank. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Now I'm positioning myself. Remember I told you the scripture. Um, I see the economy going to crash. I see it. The unemployment rate is at the lowest it's been in literally almost a century. The Wall Street is at the highest it's ever been in American history. Um, There's no more, the rubber band has been stretched as far as it can go. It must come back in. It must be market correction. There's going to be another, another economic crash. 
the only when the economic crash happens, the only people who will be able to take advantage of everything going on sale. Remember in 2007 when all the real estate went on sale mm-hmm. and the banks went lending. And so guess who bought the real estate? People that had liquid assets. I'm now preparing myself for the crash. So we're liquidating over $500,000 worth of property, uh, whether we refinancing or selling them. And I'm going to sit back and wait. And we're going to take that five hundred thousand, and we're going to go secure a line of credit for five million. When the crash happens, I will be in position. And I'm not going to just die. Then you got to wait till it really starts to hurt people, right? <laughs> so wait about two or three years inside the recession, and then you come out and say, "Okay, I'm going to buy this. I'm going to buy this. I'm going to buy this. I'm going to buy this." I'm going to buy this. And guys, it's it's worth a million dollars, but I'm going to get it for two hundred thousand. Now, once you get it, you got to maintain it until it comes out of recession. So make sure you guys plan for that as well. So to answer your question is that there is a certain mindset that you must begin to develop before you start practicing capitalism. Most people don't have the discipline and I'm not saying this to be arrogant or be egotistical. Money management is a mindset. If you change your mind, you'll change your money. It's one of the mantras I've had forever. If you don't have the mindset to manage credit correctly, you're going to go into debt and you're going to go bankrupt. You're going to go over leverage. Guys, this ain't for boats or bigger houses. This is for money that's going to make money. And you got to know a little bit about it. So I try not to teach it unless I'm in a smaller segment that I can really pour into the people and I think they're ready for it. When I start talking about capitalism and using other people's money, I'm not the teeth as you know the Bible says this that we should lend to many nations and borrow from none. So we're supposed to be the lender, not the borrower. The Bible says you're supposed to owe no man nothing but love. Love. Mm-hmm. So to answer your question, I don't think that we're ever more important than God. I don't think we ever see better than God. So buying property debt free for me is always the way to go. Um I'm just liquidating now because I really see a market crash coming and trying to position myself. Yeah, yeah, we, we see one too. And I guess you kind of answered my next question too. How do you know which property to hold on to and just rent out and which one to liquidate and sell? The ones that got the biggest return. <laughs> <laughs> so for example, I have one that I bought for $300. I have literally, I, I've made over $20,000 off the property. And I literally, and I'm not, being facetious at all, we have less than $5,000 in this property over a period of like five years. Mm. Less than 5,000 over a period of five years. And we made about $20,000. Well, it's been more than that. Because, uh, yeah, if you can pull the file, just pull one. Um, no, I made more than 20 because that, ho- that house rents for $1,000 a month and I've had it now four years. So I've made $12,000 a year. It's 48,000. Let's take out some vacancy rates. So I made about $40,000 on this property. I got about $5,000 into it. Wow. I'm selling that property. I've already made my money back. I bought it for 300. I got about $5,000, $300 into it. And it's worth $70,000. So we're selling that with the tenant in it for 70 grand, which means that over four years, that $5,000 made me $110,000. Yeah, $110,000. I, I'll take that. I'll be like a good deal. Right, yeah. Right. <laughs> How has your experience been though working, um, I guess, side by side with the county? Because I've heard people say, well, you got to be careful where you purchase and where you buy because sometimes. Yeah, the city can be a trip. Yeah. And especially if they know that you got the property for pennies on the dollar like that, they can try to, I guess, permits and uh, regulations to make sure to get the home up to code. So, how has your experience personally been? working with the counties listen to people who have already been there uh i'm hard-headed so i think i know everything and i went into a certain city that i won't name and we had three properties there and i sold all three properties i got my money back and i was happy to get my money back and i said i never buy in those counties again so (laughs) (laughs) not counties but those cities again yeah uh they was like do not buy in the city like i'm like oh man you just need to get you know make sure your your contract is to certify with the city everything gonna be okay no, um, I, I'm gonna tell you guys this, and this is why I love the His and Her Money Show because I can be just transparent. You see this all the time, guys. Please understand, everything is spiritual. 
even money, even transactions. And he wants to do everything he can to keep you broke because if he can keep you broke, he can keep the church broke, he can keep the kingdom broke. But if you have the means, many people have the heart to give, but don't have the means to give. Mm -hmm. But if you could ever have the means to give and you have the heart to give, how much more can we do for the kingdom? So he's going to fight you economically because he knows that you have the heart to do and push the kingdom. So he keeps you broke to keep the church broke. So even when you start dealing with things like property sales or Forex or whatever other investment that his or her money teaches, he's going to attack you in that area because it's not really about you. It's about the broader picture of the kingdom. And so we have intercessors that literally pray for us on a daily basis as a ministry, because this is my ministry. And I know that the enemy has plans and attack. So I've seen where in Hammond, Indiana, where literally um, we bought a property. Um, they put it on the demolition list. Uh, it was Miss Perlene Jenkins' house. She was, she literally, when we went into the house, it was like a time capsule. capsule. Uh, this is actually on our, on our YouTube. Uh, we went into the house. There was the old, you remember the old record players? Mm -hmm. Literally on the record player, the Nita was on the record was Precious Lord. Mm. Wow. She had served her church. We found a program where she had served her church for over 50, I think it was 53 years. And it was like 53 years of service to Miss Perlene Jenkins. They... We found, and I'm not talking about a box. I'm saying boxes, and I'm not exaggerating. I'm nothing but awards and awards and awards and awards. NAACP, Urban League, National Black Caucus, just award. I'm like, man, who was this woman? So, of course, we're there. The county, what was, what was he? City councilman. The city councilman stops by the house. Did you guys buy this house? It's Miss Berlin Jenkins' old house. Well, he's the president of the NAACP. And he was like, yeah, she was the old president in the NAACP and I took it after her and blah, yada, yada. I said, man, I got all kinds of awards in here. He says, nobody came and got them? I said, man, this house is the time. Nobody's coming. The dishes are here. The, the furniture's here. He says, nobody. She served this community for over 50 plus years and nobody got her stuff? He said, how did you get this property? It's off the tax sale. And he was livid. And I say livid. He was so livid that they've now named the street after Miss Perlene Jenkins. Uh, I'm telling you this because Miss Pearlene Jenkins' house ended up on the demo list. And I went down. Now, there's nothing wrong with this house. It was just vacant for, I think it was seven years. And they said, well, if the property's been vacant that long, we're just going to knock it down. And I went down there to fight for Miss Pearlene Jenkins' house. We had the NAACP down there. We had the National Black Caucus. So we came into the City Ordinance Commission, literally with just a room full of people from the community. And um, I didn't know protocol that I was supposed to go talk to the inspector first on the side. And so he's seen this as a public challenge and he was going to do everything he could to make sure I did not get Miss Berlin Jenkins' house off the demo list. And I'm going to win. What are you talking about, man? We got God on our side, kingdom. What are you talking about? We're going to win. And I'm not going to say his name. He did everything. And I say everything. He called meetings with me and I showed up and he wasn't there and said he didn't do meetings. And then um, he called him, he called him, he tried to get me with me. I said, I'm going to be out of town. And he said, I never called and said, I'm not going to be out of town. So I didn't hit meetings. And it was just, I mean, just everything he could do to make sure that he made life miserable for me. He did it. And so we just ended up selling the property. We was like, you know what? And then I had another property that I had to get permits for. Well, guess who had to give me my permits? Same guy. Same guy. <laughs> so i will never buy in the city ever again uh i was hard-headed i didn't listen um and so yeah guys you gotta know i mean it's they're learning lessons and i'm not saying this thing if it was easy everybody would be doing it yeah. it is a job i said job because it is it, it takes time it takes time diligence due diligence research it takes time it takes a little bit of money but the return that you get as a result of it, it's, 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 it's just, I don't think there's anything in the world like it. Guys, I own 100 properties debt free. Five years ago, I was homeless. Wow. Now, Ty and I, we are big, big, big demonstrators and proponents of education. We don't just tell people they should invest in education, we invest yeah. hundreds of dollars, wow. thousands of dollars in education 
And you mentioned that you have courses and conferences. So can you please let us know a little bit more about what you're offering? Because this, this and can be he has a special discount for our listeners. This can be a valuable tool of wealth building, but mm -hmm. you have to do it right. So talk to us about what you teach and the products that you have. Um, well, first of all, I think you guys already do an excellent job of teaching uh, financial education. So I decided I'm not going to discount any of those products. Um, I want you guys to buy from his or her money. But if you want to do some real estate, <laughs> <laughs> we have we have three different packages for you. We have one that's just for beginners. You say, George, you know what? I, I heard doing his and her money show, and I think I want to know a little bit more about it. And so we have what's called a starter package. Right? And we really just do the basics, the startership. Uh, and then we have what we call the beginner's package. And this is where you're really getting your feet wet and really start to understand really what tax and investment is and how do you do your research. And then we have our advanced package. And this is, you know, going through the legal process. How do I figure out my return on my investment? You know, and there's three different phases. Uh, if you buy, of course, you buy the advance, you get the beginner and the starter. If you buy the beginner, you get the starter. They, you know, uh, they're tiered. Um, and just for the His and Her Money show, uh, we did create a discount code uh, for everybody that's here. It is H-A-H-M, uh, and that stands for His and Her Money, H-A-H-M. And we decided to discount every product that we deal with with real estate, 50% off. 50%. Wow. Wow, thank you. It's amazing. 50%. So, Use the code H-A-H-M. We'll make sure that we have the links and the discount yeah. code in the show notes. Yeah, we'll be sure to link it up, guys. You, This is this is valuable information. And this so. is something that's doable. George started this journey at rock bottom. So you have no excuse no matter what your current financial situation is. This is an inroad into building wealth through investing in real estate. So we want you guys to hit the link in the show notes of this episode. And remember, use the code H A H M to get 50% off no matter which of these uh, course offerings that you choose. George, man, this was incredible. Man, you laid it out for us and yeah. we're excited. I mean, we yeah. personally are excited mm -hmm. about learning this. Come topic. on over here to Indiana. You're 30 minutes away. Let me show you some of this property and I want to see y'all at the next sale. That's our All plan. Right. All right. That's so, there. George, you really plan on it. Oh yeah, hundred percent. We're gonna take you up on that. Yep. All right, I'm gonna, gonna go run into us eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to see you at the next auction, and I want you to bring a hundred kingdom people. You come first. Come spy out the land. Okay. Right. Okay. And then the next, I want you to bring a hundred kingdom people with you, and watch Gary transition. And yes. Okay. Wow. You got That's, a deal. Yep. So we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. We know you have to run here from, from finding out before, about this before. land. Uh, so we appreciate you <laughs> making you time so to make this interview happen. No problem. I want to say one more thing, you guys, that I think I failed to mention. Uh, I think it came up in a question, but because I talked too much, I kind of missed it. And uh, when you guys go to other cities or other counties or even your city, your county, uh, please understand if you're in California, you're not going to get a property for $500. Right, California is a hundred thousand. I mean, you're looking right. at very extensive property. I want to make sure I get full disclosure. I don't want to be at all deceitful. Uh, New York, um, if you were in what they call that that what is it, Queens, um, Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, what's the fourth ward? Harlem. Harlem. They don't even they have tax sales there, but they only do it to one company. I think it's illegal. Based, I read the state statute. I think it's illegal. But that's the way it's done. So you're not going to even buy there. Now you can buy outside of those areas, but you're not going to buy there. Texas, guys. So depending on where you guys are will depend on what the value, because it's an auction. And so people are going to bid those auctions up. I'm just in the area that people have seen that people say there's nothing good in Gary. Well, Gary made me a millionaire. No, I believe that Gary's the next city is going to be gentrified in the country. Yeah. I really, really believe that. With the things that's going on in Chicago, from the taxes to the crime to <laughs> with everything that y'all doing over there, y'all taxes is amazing. I don't know how y'all can afford. I thank God y'all dead free because y'all can afford to live there if y'all want. <laughs> very, very expensive. Yep. Can't deny so, it. People are coming over here. I think it's the next place is going to be gentrified, you guys. Um, find that next spot. Go, go find it. Go spy out the land and find out where people are coming and go get it before they get there. You can develop it and hold on to it, or you can sell it and make a profit. Either way it go becomes a great investment for you. But I did want to give full disclaimer that, yeah, I've been blessed to buy property for $1,000 or $500, but 
but that does not happen in every single county. Absolutely. Every yeah. And we hope that everybody will understand that it also, it differs everywhere, even counties. So mm -hmm. just get informed and let's just get started. Boom.